Hey, well, let's start a couple minutes early. We uh, could have used every minute last week, and I know I moved quickly. Hopefully, the pace will be a little bit more tolerable this week. But if you didn't catch last week, you certainly need to, uh, to catch up on that. I know we've got so many things that happen in our community on Thursday nights, and um, so if you happen to miss last week, be sure to catch up on that. But we're going to spend a little, time, a little bit of time praying. So let's pray, and then we'll dive into part four. Is that right? Part four? Second week on the Bible. So let's talk about that after we talk to God. Pray with me. God, we need your help clearly to understand anything, really. We need your involvement in our minds. We need just your empowerment to think clearly about anything that relates to you. We are so dependent on special revelation that has been given that helps us to understand you in a way that we wouldn't otherwise know. We want your activity in our minds as we think about expressing our hope and confidence in your word. It's not easy. It's certainly a source of satanic attack in our culture, in our society, and even perhaps in our minds in temptation to question the word what you've said, just like Satan in the garden in Genesis 3, when um, maybe even our flesh is rising up to say, did God really say? So help us, God, to be clear thinking about your word tonight. Let us think um, your thoughts after you as it relates to what your word is, certainly as we look to Christ and what he thought, what he taught, what he affirmed, and by example, laid out as a template for us to think about divine revelation. We want to stand with him and not with the vocal uh, detractors of our culture. God, we know it's easy to uh, criticize things we don't want to submit to. It's easy to take pot shots at your word. Certainly been a favorite of the cultists to undermine the authority of scripture and So we pray as we think about standing up for what is true as we dialogue about your word with our non-Christian neighbors and our coworkers, with those that surround us, even those we just meet for the first time and start talking about spiritual things and get back to the topic of the Bible. I just pray that tonight might be helpful and not overly detailed, but just the flavor and the thrust of it all being helpful in recalling just basic truths that cannot be denied, the logical foundation of the fact that you exist and have revealed yourself and that your word is a record of that revelation. So give us clarity about these things. Help us not to be uh, lazy in our words as we speak to non-Christians about this topic. Not that we need to be technical in every conversation, but we want to present a, a real cogent, rational reason for our hope, the hope that we have, that we know that what we carry around in our Bibles is, uh, is what you want us to know, your truth in scripturated, in propositional statements, in black and white. And uh, God, we're just thankful for all that we were able to touch on last week. Think about the historicity of the manuscript evidence of the New Testament even the Old Testament, as we thought about the scribal work that was done, the preservation of your word. We're grateful, God, for just the openness and transparency of that work. And tonight, as we think about its special claim, that we would um, just really stand in awe of what the Bible is and what it presents itself to be and what evidence there is to be confident in that claim. So God, uh, give us a good night, a good night of studying and thinking through this together. Thanks for this faithful team here that comes on Thursday nights. I pray this would be multiplied, not only online and streaming, but that it would be multiplied just as people echo these truths, not just with non-Christians, but as we encourage one another and strengthen our faith by talking to one another about the, the veracity of your word, the truthfulness of your revelation. So give us a good night of study, we ask, please, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we set up last time 
a basic two-week outline, which are two questions about the Bible. Is what we have what was written? And so much of what we dealt with had to give us a, I hope, a, uh, a broad and an intensive response to the people that say, well, the Bible's been translated, you know, hundreds of times that we have a book that's based on oral tradition or who can trust the Bible. And as even I prayed, I just know the satanic attack upon the transmission of the text um, is everywhere. I mean, there's hardly a cult group that has not begun with an undermining of the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. So we have to deal with is what we're carrying around in our Bibles. And of course, we are one step removed in the sense that we all are reading it in English, or most of us are. So we, you know, we, we, we have to have confidence in the translation. We have to be, have confidence in the textual support that underlies the critical editions of the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. But we spent some time with that, and I hope that was helpful. It's one of those messages that I think is best um, reviewed a few times. And I, I I heard many of you say that to me last week and in their intervening days. So the second half of that that we preview just with this very statement is the next question is if this is a record of what was actually written, if this is an accurate representation of the things that the prophets wrote and the apostles wrote, I mean, do we take their message as what it claims to be? Is what they wrote really God's message and not just their message? As I like to say, is this man's best thoughts about God, or maybe it's not even God, man's best thoughts. Maybe you pick some other way to devote yourself to the teaching of some other religion that thinks they've got a better set of thoughts regarding God, or is this actually God's message to us on paper? So we dealt with the first one last week. We're dealing with the second question tonight. Hardly worth even a point on the outline, but just to give you that clear delineation. And I think that may be helpful in your apologetics just to make sure that you recognize there's two steps to this. And I think this is important, I guess, just to look at the books that are out there that might help you do apologetics. I, I rarely see it cleanly broken down like that. Not that it takes any genius insight to come up with that, but I, I mean, if you're going to write a little paperback 10-chapter book on apologetics, it'd be good if you had one chapter dealing with is what we have, what, what is written, and then is what we have actually God's message, if there's reasons to believe that. So thinking that way, I think is helpful. We talk to non-Christians and make sure we understand the two different questions there. All right, let's deal with the Bible's claim. And, and the Bible's claim is that this book is breathed out by God, and we need to spend some time understanding that term. And there's a lot of things we've dealt with in the past decade at Compass Night where we have to deal with this term. But even if it's redundant, I don't, as the apostles say, uh, feel too bad about, maybe in my flesh I do, but I shouldn't in my spirit feel too bad about repeating these things because they're important to stress. They're a safeguard for you. So let's look at the passage that is a central text. We just briefly quoted it last week. But as Paul writes to Timothy back to a church he'd spent over three years at, he had installed a young pastor, Timothy, relatively speaking, a young pastor, and he writes to him, Timothy, and says, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which is a great descriptive, by the way, of how he views Scripture there, his high view of Scripture. This is a holy, set-apart, special, this is unique books, not like any other, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, all Scripture is, now here's our phrase, breathed out by God. And of course, we're reading the English Standard Version, which we use here, not because we think it's the only translation that accurately represents the original languages or has the best text-critical work done, although it's top drawer. It's just that it's good for me to preach to you with a translation that you're using that I'm using as I preach, which by the way, I guess I should take a minute to say that. Some people say, well, I want to bring a different translation. Well, you can bring 15 translations to church if you'd like, but it's good for you uh, to have the translation that, that we use here and we've carefully, thoughtfully, and prayerfully picked that, at least for now. That wasn't a telegraph that we're changing our translation here, but, but that's not the word we're used to seeing in Scripture. In this verse, all the way back to Tyndale's translation in 1526, our first 
English trans translation, we have the word inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. King James in 1611, most popular English translation, right, in Western civilization, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard, the New Living Translation, the, the Net Bible, the New English Translation, um, the um, Christian Standard Bible, which is increasingly popular in our circles, the, um, the Authorized Standard Version of 8, 1901, the New Century Version, the um, New Revised Standard Version, etc., etc., et they're all giving us this word inspiration, inspiration, inspiration. So this key word we've got to deal with, we've got to understand, since 1526, the first and one of the most central passages on the New Testament, the first translation of this central passage in this key term is translated with the word inspiration. If you were to look at Jerome's Vulgate or the Latin translation of the Bible, which was the translation of the Bible for over a thousand years, it's the translation of the church for over a thousand years as the church moved west and most of the scholarship resided in the west. Uh, they were teaching and preaching and writing in Latin and so this was a very important translation in Latin and the Latin translation of this word in Greek is translated in the Vulgate in 405 uh, divinitus inspirata. Divinitus Inspirata, and I think you can see pretty quickly, we talk about a Masters of Divinity or Jesus claimed to be divine. You see the word Divinitus, you know that means um, of God. And then you've got this word Inspirata, which you can see transliterating at least the root of it into English, inspired. Well, I actually pulled this off my shelf and took a picture of it with my iPhone today. Here is what you'll find if you open up a Latin lexicon, it will talk about the word inspiro and what it means in Latin. So here's the key word in Latin, inspirato. We get the word inspiration, transliterated into English. The old Latin definition of inspiro, which is the noun form of it, it declines kind of like Greek. Here's the first person dictionary form noun, I'm sorry, um, um, not noun, uh, verb, not noun, sorry. The dictionary form of the verb is not inspirata, it's inspiro, same word, it's just declined differently, is to breathe or to blow in or to blow on or to blow out. That's what the word inspirata means or inspiro, the verb in Latin. So when you think about it, and this is a picture I threw up last week, it, it's, uh, it's like you breathing out something, you can't see your breath unless it's cold and, you know, humid or whatever it is that it takes to do that. Um, and if you're talking, you can see your breath, you can see your words coming out, at least the breath of your mouth that's making the vibrations in the air. Um, that's the concept of God breathed. God breathed as though God is talking. The Greek term, of course, which is the language of the New Testament, is a compound word. Theo, um, which you know, theos is God, and nuo, like pneumatic tools or pneumonia, uh, these are words that you should recognize from English. Uh, theos, God, theo, and uh, nuo or nustos is the word that's used elsewhere in Scripture. Matthew 7, 25, for instance, talking about very literal wind blowing. The streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against the house. And you remember that? It's the end of Jesus' longest recorded sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about build your house on the rock, do what I say, and it'll go better for you than if you don't. So blowing winds is that, there's our word, nuo. Um, Luke 12, 55, the south wind nuo, is it blows. And you say it's going to be hot, and, and it is. You know how to tell the weather. Uh, John 6, 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. So this is the idea. God blows something out, which is exactly what this is supposed to give you a sense of, is that God is breathing out something. And what is he breathing out? The ta graphe, the, the, the scriptures, the, uh, the graphics, the writings. Uh, all scripture is blown out by God. So the scriptures as they understood it, the Old Testament scriptures, at least at the time that they were, I mean, in reference to that particular text in 2 Timothy 3.16, God is, has blown them out. He's spoken them. I mean, that's the image if you want to get that uh, cartoonish about it, is God blowing out a book. He's breathing out a book. He's speaking out this book. Um, inspirata, inspiration. Modern definition in English, 
if you look up the word inspiration in your dictionary, you're going to find a definition that has to do with your mind being stimulated or um, your emotions being stirred. That's definition number one. Definition number two is having a sudden creative act or idea. These are closely related. I'm inspired to do something. And as I like to illustrate it, you can look at your garage one day and you can have a moment of inspiration and say, I need to clean my garage. And a lot of people look at the word inspiro and they really look at the word inspiration and they think, well, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about you being inspired to do something. That is not what we're talking about in Old Latin. Old Latin and the transliteration into Tyndale's English has nothing to do with that. I mean, I guess there's something to do with that lexically etymologically as it relates to the word, but that's not the point. The point has to do with breathing something out. It's not having a sudden creative stirring in my mind to do something. And you can see how confusing this is for the modern person that's heard about uh, biblical inspiration or the Bible being inspired, and they can easily connect the modern definition to the old meaning and I mean, they can replace, I should say, the old meaning with a modern definition, and they come up with a completely wrong doctrine of the Scripture. In other words, think of the adjective, inspirata, right? Uh, divinitus inspirata, or, or theonustos, the, the blowing out of God. If you're looking at the adjective that all Scripture is blown out by God, the question is, what is it describing? Most people, when they think about the word inspiration, think about the writers, Matter of fact, I hear very accomplished Christian leaders talk about, uh, you know, when, when the writers were inspired to write the scriptures. They use that phrase, and I want to stop them and say, that's not what you mean, is it? Because that's not what this text means when it uses the word in Latin, inspirata. It, it, it has nothing to do with the writers being inspired. If it meant that, then the adjective would describe the writers, but that's not what's being described in the passage, not the writers. Um, and then, of course, the reader. Someone showed me today a uh, really interesting manuscript uh, display that's going to go on here in South Orange County, which was great. And uh, archaeological expert, apparently uh, manuscript expert, I didn't know him, coming down to do some lecturing here uh, next month. Not next month, the month after the next and uh, they named it, uh, and I wish I could have memorized it. I just saw it before I walked over here. Uh, something about uh, the inspiring Bible, I think is what it was called. Inspiring Bible. They're thinking, well, that's exactly, someone texted that to me, said, what do you think of this? And I said, well, the first thing I don't like, because I just was preparing for tonight, well, I don't like the, the misuse of the word inspiring, because that is a mixing of the concept of biblical inspiration and thinking, well, the Bible sure is inspiring. Well, is the Bible inspiring? I guess it can inspire me to do a lot of things, but that, I think we should be careful with the word, if we're going to use the word inspired, to say we're not talking about the reader being inspired. We're not talking about you getting inspired by the Bible. The adjective in the text of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, is that the documents themselves are inspired which makes no sense with the modern definition of the word inspired. What does it mean to be inspired? Well, I know what it means to be inspired. If I hear the word of God read to me and I'm inspired to do something, and I can think about, wow, I imagine those writers were inspired one day to write the Bible. You can use that word with the modern definition, and there's some correspondence to reality, but that's not what the word means when you talk about the Bible being inspired, because then you just used, in that sentence, inspirata or inspiration as an adjective for the documents, not the writers nor the readers. And again, if that's just, if, I, if that's repeating, I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry. Because we need to know that. So many people that should know better using the word inspired in a way that confuses what the doctrine of inspiration is. So, picture inspired is breathing out a book. That's the idea. The Words are breathed out by God, but we have a record of those words in writing. Propositional sentences and words. So, what's inspired? The book is inspired. God breathed. All right. There's another phrase, letter B, where God describes the book. And again, I know this is all circular reasoning right now. Right? The Bible talking about itself. We're going to have to spend the rest of the the second half of the night dealing with, does that make any sense? But we're just dealing with the claims right now, the Bible's claims. 
And first of all, the Bible says it's inspired. It speaks of itself that way. And we'll talk about the totality of the Bible in a second. The other way it describes the spirit involved in this, and I say the other way because the word breath, nuo, is also the word, not just for breath, but it's also the word in Scripture for spirit. And we talk about God and nuo, we're often talking about the Holy Spirit. So it can get confusing, but let's keep these things clear in our minds. The breathing out of Scripture, and then this phrase from 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And I think we quoted this briefly last week as well in a different context, but let's read it here on the screen. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, no prophetic word in the writings, comes from one's own interpretation of what? Of reality, of God, of anything. They're not just saying, here's what I think, right? The Bible's not what people think. That's why he says it's not man's thoughts about God's or thoughts, thoughts about God or, or man's best thought, thoughts about God. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. It wasn't like we, the, the prophets wanted to write the scripture and it was like, I'm deciding to create this book. That's not the idea. It wasn't produced by the will of man. But man, here's our phrase, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty common word in, in the Greek New Testament. But the picture of a passive sense of the word Pharaoh or, or, or carried along, you start looking for in scripture and you see how that works. Carry is usually a very active word, right? I am carrying something. Now, if I'm talking from the referent of the thing I'm carrying, well, then that's a, that, then I can speak in a passive. That thing is being carried along. And so, when we think about us being carried along, you might think of what we see in Acts 27, when you see a ship or people in that ship carried along. And as Luke speaks about the voyage here in Acts 27, he says, when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we couldn't, you know, tack our way into the wind, we gave way to it. We're already setting ourselves up for a passive use of the word Pharaoh here. We gave way to it and were, here's our word, driven along. We were carried along. That's the word. Same word. Carried along. In the next verse, or two verses later, Acts 27, 17, it says, after hoisting it up, talking about the ship was starting to tear apart, they used supports to undergird the ship, so they kind of held the hole together. And they lowered the gear, which is an interesting Greek word, and we're not sure what that means. Matter of fact, I think the right reading may be the ESV marginal reading, since you get some technical sailing words and boat words, mar uh, you know, marina words in, in this section of Scripture, chapter 27. Uh, the marginal reading in the ESV is the, probably means the sail. Well, we're not sure what the gear means, but we're assuming that they lowered the sail, like you have in this ancient replica of an ancient ship here. And they were, and here it is again, a passive form of the same word. They were driven along. They were carried along. Pharaoh in a passive ten, uh, sense. Passive sense. So the picture here is of the writer being carried along. Now, our passage that's the central passage for New Testament, or, I'm sorry, for biblical inspiration is a word about God breathing out the words, but here you have the agents of writing this down being described as being carried along, and clearly it speaks of in, in, in Second uh, Peter chapter 1, verses 21, 20 and 21, it, they are carried along, and they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, by the way, there's the word nuo, it's the word in the noun form, uh, spirit. So the spirit is carrying them along. So I can speak in those terms as long as I'm thinking of the right passage, but I don't like the word inspired used in that way because that makes somebody think about having a prophecy of their own will and their own interpretation or having some creative act. That's not how it worked. The Spirit of God was moving people, it says here in 2 Peter chapter 1, to write these words. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were, there's our word, Pharaoh in, the, in a passive, carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, the Bible's claim is that the books of the Bible, so far what we've got is two passages speaking about prophecy, which in anyone's 
reasonable interpretation of the passage, we're going to think about the Old Testament. So we've got to think further about, does this include our New Testament? Because you're going to share the gospel with a non-Christian, and we're talking about Christ and what Jesus said. And so we need to know if inspiration in the minds of Scripture, is this the claim extend to the New Testament? I was just talking beforehand with someone at a table about when I taught bibliology here. I got a much longer lecture on all of the things, well, at least that I use for that lecture, that speak to New Testament inspiration. So you can look that up. It's all available on Focal Point. But let me just briefly give you a couple of things and some things new here that weren't in there, at least other passages that I enlisted here, to have us think about New Testament claims regarding the inspiration of the Bible, the authority and inspiration of Scripture in the New Testament. Let me start with this, the comparative. An argument in Hebrews chapter 2, which is often made in Hebrews, from lesser to greater. The argument is, if it's true about that, which you think is so great, it's even more true about this, which makes this even greater. If it was true about that message that was so urgent, well, it's certainly true about this message that's even more urgent. I mean, that's like so much of the book of Hebrews is based on that because it's comparing the old covenant and the new covenant. And look, here's one example from Hebrews chapter 2. We, it says, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. And the point is, throughout the book, they're hearing the message of the new covenant, the message of Christ the Messiah and the fulfillment of the Old Testament, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels, and clearly that was the beginning of Old Testament revelation, when God gave revelation on Mount Sinai through the angels, mitigated through the angels, mediated rather through the angels, it wasn't mitigated by the angels, they'd be in big trouble if it were mitigated by the angels, mediated by the angels to Moses, and we started the writing in 1446 BC of, well, starting in Exodus chapter 20, but we start then the revelation in Exodus 20, and then the entire Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. If that message that was declared by angels, mediated through angels, proved to be reliable, and we know starting with the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, it proved to be true and reliable, as we'll see why in the second half of our lecture tonight. And if every transgression or disobedience, if you didn't do what it said, received a just retribution, we're not talking about human courts here, we're talking about God, then how are we going to neglect, if, how are we going to escape, rather, that kind of punishment, if we neglect such a great salvation. This salvation that was declared first by the Lord, he was the one who taught it, the kingdom message, the message of the gospel and forgiveness and him being the Lamb of God. And it was attested to us by those who heard. So starting with the written gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest of the New Testament, to the extent that it was written at the time this was written, these things were attested to us. They were verified to us while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, that's a big argument that we're going to have to look at to the non-Christian in your workplace. It's going to say, I'm not buying a lot of things about that passage, like that there can be signs and wonders. More on that to come. But in this particular lecture, what we need to see is the argument from lesser to greater. There was a message declared in the Old Testament starting with Moses and the Pentateuch. That proved to be a reliable word from God. And now what we have in the New Testament is a message that was declared by Christ, just like angels mediated a, a message. Now Christ comes, as that's how the whole book of Hebrews starts. God spoke to us in, in our fathers in many portions, many ways, various in sundry ways, and then he spoke, speaks was now in his son. And the point is, the message through his son, attested by those who heard him, his apostles, that's even, I mean, you're going to be in even bigger trouble if you neglect that. In other words, it's going to prove to even be just as reliable, if something can be more reliable, as true. And if you disobey it and transgress it, you're going to receive a retribution or a payback that you deserve, a just retribution, and you'll be in big trouble. That argument... If you just think about that passage, you say, well, I get it now. The New Testament is just as authoritative as the Old Testament, at least to the extent at this particular point in the book of Hebrews, looking back at what's been said. And here it's saying we've already got a message from those who heard Christ, came from Christ to those who heard him. It's come to us, and it's even more urgent and important can't be more urgent or important if it's truth, but we dare not neglect it. 
One of the reasons, by the way, if you compare this to Galatians 1, as we said, New Testament survey two years ago or last year, whenever that was, the Apostle Paul, I don't think can reasonably be the author of this book. Lots of great theories about who the author of Hebrews was. But I remember growing up in a church, I think my Sunday school teacher talked about Paul writing Hebrews and still hear that, but comparing Galatians 1 where he says, I didn't receive this message from any man. We just read it, didn't we, in our daily Bible reading? These two passages don't mesh to give me a sense that Paul wrote it. So anyway, all right, another passage. Talking about the claims now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 8. As he's preaching here in writing to the Thessalonians, he says, whoever disregards this, what I just said, what he wrote in the first seven verses, disregards not man, but God. You're blowing God off. Who, and here's the inference, Holy Spirit is speaking through me, writing through me here. I'm getting these words down by the governance of the Spirit, and that Spirit that he gave to you because you're born again Christians here, you're indwelt by the Spirit, you're disregarding the God who gave you that spirit. The spirit's now speaking to you through me, and you can't disregard it. Sounds a lot like Hebrews chapter 2. What kind of just re recompense will you get from God if you disregard this message because it's as important as the Old Testament. And here, it's just equally God's message as it was in the Old Testament in the New. 1 Thessalonians 2 Verse 13, he says, we thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. Now, what was Paul preaching when he came to Thessalonica? He was preaching the New Testament message of the gospel. And he came bringing that and then writing that as he did and saying he got this from God himself, which you heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So God is at work in you and this message has taken root in you, as it says in, as Peter wrote, this word implanted in you, it's bearing fruit, it's changed you, it's made you new, it's the imperishable seed by which you were born again, and that is the word of God. We thank God that you received it for what it was, you accepted it for what it is. New Testament truth, it's the word of God. That's what we call the Old Testament, that's what we call the Bible, the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 13. We often, and we like to do this with the Bible, just assume everything to ourselves. Um, anytime we see the word we or us, we think it's us, unless it's a passage we don't want to apply to ourselves because it's a bad passage. But we got to be careful in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. This is about Paul and the apostolic band. As a matter of fact, he starts in chapter 2, verse 1, by saying, we, when we came to you, we came proclaiming the testimony of God. In other words, he's speaking of the message of the gospel coming through the apostle into Corinth. And he said, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we, who came and brought this message to you, proclaimed it to you as he starts in chapter 1, verse 1, which is just a chapter away, chapter and a half away. He said, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. So the apostolic message. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, and then we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Do you see how important that is to read that carefully in context? I came to you as an apostle with a message. We got that from God. Where do we get it? We got it from the Spirit, because no one knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God gave it to us, and we passed it on to you. It's the Word of God. The Spirit of God brought it. The Spirit of God governed this message, and it's not a human message. It's taught by the Spirit. And everyone likes to quote this passage and try and apply it to themselves. But it's, I guess you're on the receiving end of it, right? I mean, we read the words of the apostles, and we have the wisdom of God but we're a step removed from being the agent of the revelation. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. This one's often quoted, and rightly so, but it's a simpler statement by Peter. Peter certainly believes what he's saying here and wants his readers to believe it, and that is that 
something about Paul's writings here. The count the patience of our Lord is salvation, which he just said God's not slow in keeping his promises as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you not wish, wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. So he's waiting on the return of Christ and the destruction of the world and the establishment of the kingdom, the new world where righteousness dwells, because he wants more people to get saved. If that were to happen today, then people that get saved tomorrow are not going to be saved. So theoretically, at least from a human perspective, so he says, that's what I just taught you. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, which is not he had a lot of, you know, neat experiences and got to be really wise. No, it's that wisdom that I just talked about as he spoke to the Corinthians saying, we receive the wisdom from God, not taught by men, by the Spirit. The Spirit knows the mind of God. The mind of God is revealed to us via the Spirit. The Spirit then allows us to impart that wisdom to you as he does in all of his letters. So all of Paul's letters here, that's what we have here. I'm assuming not a note to his mother, right? But the writings that are existing and circulating among the early Christians, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters, these spiritual matters about God, and God's kingdom, and the coming of Christ, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. And there are, clearly, if you've read enough of the New Testament, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do. Now, here's the comparative phrase. It's very important the other scriptures, as they do the other scriptures. And there's the very specific word that is constantly used in the New Testament to describe God's writings, his God-breathed writings, the graphe, the translated the scriptures, the writings, the sacred writings. We call them over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, or Paul did. So Paul's writings in all of his letters are the other scripture. And if you were to disregard them, you'd be disregarding God, as it says there, to the Thessalonians, but now it says, Peter says about Paul's writings, if you twist them ignorantly, you'll do that to your own demise, which takes us all the way back to the first one I gave you, which is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So how does this work? Well, it works like this. Here's the picture. Acts chapter 1, verse 16, I read on the weekend, we were preaching through this passage on Sunday. If you were in the 9 o'clock service, you got the shortest sermon for me you've ever heard. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. I'm embarrassed. But I at least read this passage to you on Sunday in that 15-minute time span where Peter stands up there with 120 in his presence and he says, Scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. So we're talking about Scripture, okay? Old Testament Scripture in this case. And it had to be fulfilled, which by the way, remember it's been translated how many times if you're reading it in English text? One time, unless you're reading the message or, you know, the children's Bible or the living Bible, that's a paraphrase. Then it goes from Greek to English to English again. But in this case, we have good translations translated one time. So the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke. Now that's all I'm trying, I'm trying to make this point regarding what inspiration is. Right? So the Holy Spirit's going to say these things, but he doesn't do it without an intermediate agency. It's not the clouds breaking forth with sound that people hear. Right? There is a message by the mouth of David. So you've got God speaking in the scriptures via the mouth of David, which of course is a way to speak of what David said, but he didn't say it literally. He may have said it, but he wrote it. And so we have in scripture, he quotes uh, Psalm 106, Psalm 96, 96, 106, that we quoted on Sunday. So this implies two steps, two steps that are very important theologically. And one is God is going to reveal to David something that then he's going to write down. And the two key words that we deal with in bibliology, the first two steps, we deal with God revealing those things to David. And then in the case of a Psalm, in this case, those particular Davidic Psalms, and then David getting them down in writing. So now I have in those two steps, the codification of God's thoughts on paper. That's what we need to understand. We call it inspiration because I can't change the entire world and every theological book or doctrinal book or study Bible is going to use the word inspiration. So I'm just conceding the fact that they're going to call it the doctrine of inspiration. But what we're talking about is that God breathed it out through the prophets. And he did that through carrying them along by the Holy Spirit to write down on paper 
what needed to be codified is God made that process work. And that we see David confessing to. Think about 2 Samuel chapter 23, where he says things like this, the spirit of Yahweh speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. Whose word? It's his word. I'm going to tell you what he says. That's what a prophet does. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, colon, here it comes what God said. So David recognizes that in his day, it gets written down. That first step is revelation. Second step, writing it down, is inspiration, the God-breathed part of it. And then you can pick it up, in their case, a thousand years later, and stand up in a room with 120 people and say, here's what God had said. And here's what God says. And David recognized that spirit of Yahweh speaks by me, by the agency of me. And there's that picture. Look at it again, right? God's thoughts, David's mind. God then superintends to get it on paper. Then we pick it up and read it after it's translated if you don't read the original languages. All right. More, Acts 28, 25. The Holy Spirit was right in saying. So here it is again. He said it to your fathers initially, your patriarchs, your forefathers, your ancestors. Now here it is again. Look at the agency. Through, oh, it translated once, through the prophet Isaiah. So God, specifically the third person of the Godhead, is going to speak something that's in his mind into the mind of Isaiah the prophet and get it into writing. That's the pattern. Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. You got revelation, gets to Isaiah, inspiration, it gets down in writing. Another one I was thinking about is Acts chapter 3. I didn't make a slide for it, but the same idea. When he's preaching there, Peter is, he tells them to repent so the Spirit so the spirit, so that God can send Christ back, dispatch Christ back so that the times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. He said, whom uh, and he might send Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive till the time of the restoring of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets long ago. God spoke. He utilized the prophets to do it. And it says mouth, which is a way to refer to their writings, because of course we wouldn't even know that were it not codified for us generations later. So that's the Bible's claim. The Bible's claim is what we call the doctrine of inspiration. So letter D, is there a letter D on there? There's not, is there? It's funny that I just remembered that from my memory. That's the only place you can remember things from, by the way. Um, but I just thought about that. It did look a little sparse, this outline, didn't it? But you knew it wouldn't be. So let's add a little letter D. Not that I don't mean to insult your intelligence every week by writing down the letters for you. You can write down a letter D, a definition. I apologize for not having letter D there. I didn't even have letter C, though, right? Is that what you're going to say? What was letter C? Was it on there? Another imperfect thing. I can't even think of what it might have been. Oh, Old and New Testament is what it could have been. It not only could have been that, it was that. It was that, and it was probably on the screen for those of you who just yelled at me. Look, letter C. Letter C. You didn't think letter C was on there. I'm sorry, what? I know it's not on the paper. I just, I just walked over and grabbed the paper. You saw me grab the paper. It took me one letter to catch up and realize, wait a minute, in my mind's eye, I only picture B. I know it's not on the paper. So you wrote it down though, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Yes. You're plotting for yourself. And then I said, you ought to write down letter D because I finally caught up and realized I didn't have a letter D. All right. It's been a really long day. Let's give a definition. Say it again. Is there a letter E? I don't know. 
Half of you taking notes on other things anyway. So is there a letter E? Yes, there's a letter E. It's coming up. I see it <laughs> on slide 52. <laughs> Divine inspiration is the process. Here's my definition, which is a lot like other people who have a high view of Scripture. These are just the, this is the way I like to teach it, like, like, the, like to word it this way. It's the process by which the Holy Spirit recorded his message, his message, in words, right? Using chosen human instruments. About Forty authors in the New Testament, I mean, the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, utilizing their writing styles, which there's no way around that. We recognize the writing styles are different all throughout the Old and New Testament even the language, if you just think most basically, right? You got Aramaic and Hebrew in the Old Testament. You got Greek in the New Testament. Those are different writing styles right there. Different languages, different vocabulary. So they utilize their own writing styles, recording, right? Resulting in an exact record. This is exactly record of God's revelation. He wanted to reveal this to you. So he reveals it first to the prophets and the apostles. They record it in words using their writing styles and I'm going to concede, as we dealt with last week, right? The conclusion is in the original documents. Now, do we have the original documents? Only insofar as we reconstruct it, which is reconstructable. And that's my point. We have such a breadth of manuscript evidence in the Old Testament and a treasure trove in the New Testament that we, we've, got the, we've got the record. Are there debates about this passage and that passage? Yes, but we believe we don't have any lost books of the Bible. We don't have any lost paragraphs of the Bible. We don't have any lost verses of the Bible. So divine inspiration, the process by which the Holy Spirit recorded his message in words using chosen human authors, utilizing their writing styles, resulting in an exact record of God's revelation in the original documents. Should be plural there, sorry. This is not mechanical dictation, right? This is God utilizing their writing styles. All right. Illustration, letter E. There's your letter E right there. This will be short. Here's an illustration. If you went through bibliology, I think I had it back then as well. We believe that God sent the incarnate word. We celebrate it every Christmas. In the beginning was the word, word was with God, word was God, right? Um, what? 13 verses later. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God sends his incarnate word. How did he do it? Through a teenage girl named Mary. But she didn't have relations with Joseph to have this baby. The Holy Spirit, it says, here's the word in Luke, overshadowed her. What does that mean? It means, as we dealt with in detail on the virgin birth, if you haven't heard that sermon, that might be worth listening to because in all the years I've ever preached, it's the only sermon I think I've ever preached completely on the virgin birth, and I haven't heard too many myself from other preachers, but we got to think that through what that means, but clearly it means what anyone would think it means, a virgin birth. It did not involve two human parents. It involved one human parent, and it involved God. Special creation, specifically the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. That's the terminology. And what we believe now and affirm is that the living Word of God, Jesus Christ, was without sin. How do you have a non-sinner born to a sinning mother, right? The Catholic Church notwithstanding in their claims that are unbiblical, Right? We all recognize, and we recognize that, by the way, because the Magnificant, which is the um, Latin phrase at the beginning of Mary's prayer, she talks about God being her Savior. The only person that needs a Savior is a sinner, right? So she's clearly a sinner. She has a child who's sinless. So that happens because the Holy Spirit overshadows her, whatever that means, which we try to figure out and thinking that through from every angle biblically. And we have a perfect person. But guess what? We're assuming that the genetic material, at least half of it, is 
reflecting Mary's characteristics. Mary's melanin, Mary's hair color, Mary's eye color, we're assuming. So all of these things, did Jesus look like Mary? Probably resembled Mary. And we see the human factor in Jesus, but we recognize the divinity of Jesus, which results in the perfection of Jesus, in that he does all things well, and that he doesn't sin. Tempted in all ways as we are yet without sin. Well, that's the illustration. We believe that God sent his written word, and he utilized human authors as sinful as they can be, and they can be sinful. Clearly, they are sinners, but God superintends is the word we're using. If you want to use the biblical words, God breathes out, utilizing the human authors, which aren't in view there in 2 Timothy 3.16, but they are in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. They're there carried along by the Spirit. You can use that word, Pharaoh, in the passive. They are carried along in some way so that they give us a written word without error. It's God's exact record of what he wanted to say. That's an illustration, I think, that can help us. Because guess what? Your neighbor probably believes, if, at least for Christmas's sake, yeah, Jesus is probably a perfect guy. At least he's a lot better than me, but I think he's... I, I, I believe the Christmas carol stuff. I believe it, it's God born in a manger. Great. You affirm that, which again, I think they just give tacit approval to, but nevertheless, we're not claiming anything different here. The book that I have is God's product, utilizing human authors, which just like Mary was probably seen in the reflection of Jesus' face to some extent, so we can see Luke's reflection in his writing and Paul's reflection in his writings and Peter's reflection, and yet the end result, because of the Holy Spirit's superintending, overshadowing, carrying along of those author, authors, we have a product without error in the original manuscripts. What I want to do is think about the bigness of that claim. That is a gigantic claim. That what we're saying is that we have God's Word, and more on that. We'll look at how the Bible says that about itself. But I like to illustrate it by my table tennis skills. If I were to tell you tonight, we've got a couple ping pong tables on campus somewhere, and I said, you know what? I just want to tell you, I'm a good ping pong player. If you really have some macho vibrato, uh, bravado, you might be like, well, we'll see about that if you got some time after church tonight. But if I upped it and said, no, 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 I am a great ping pong player. You might say, if you're so great, you wouldn't use the word ping pong. You'd say table tennis. But let's just say you now start to lean forward because you think, well, I'm, I'm a really good ping pong player too. You're getting a little cocky. If I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I am a flawless ping pong player. <laughs> See, you, now you're, you've got a whole different response to that. If I said, no, 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 I, maybe I'm not clear. I am a perfect ping pong player. Matter of fact, let me elaborate. I've never hit a bad ping pong shot, and I never will. Now, that's a long way for me getting up saying, hey, you want to play after church? I'm a good ping pong player. If I stood up and said, I've never hit a bad ping pong shot, and I never will, you've got a different emotional reaction to that. Because the bigger the claim, see, the fewer options you have in responding to it. The bigness of the claim is gigantic in the, in the argument that we're making to our generation. We're not saying, hey, you know what? The Bible is a good book. We're not saying that. I know they call it the good book, but it's not claiming to be a good book. You say, I'm a great book. Well, I guess perfection involves greatness, but that's not the claim of the Bible that this is a great book like the Pali Canon and the Quran and the Book of Mormon that everyone thinks is so great. Well, the Bible's a great book too. We're not saying that. Flawless book? Well, that's exactly what the Bible is saying about itself. The claim is huge. The bigness of the claim is that every word of God is, is flawless, Proverbs 30. A perfect book. It's exactly what the Bible says. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. That's what it claims about itself. My word shall stand forever. 
It's an eternal book. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's gigantic. The bigness of that claim is huge. And I think it's good for us in our generation to recognize that, that this is an absolute claim. It's not a comparative claim. We're not saying, as I often say, this is man's best thoughts about God. We're not even saying, hey, this is the best chance we got at hearing from God. We're not saying that the Bible contains some thoughts that are, I don't know, as we would say in the modern use of the, of the word, inspired by God. We're not saying that in a modern definition of the word. We're not saying this is a, a book that can really do things in your life that other books can't do. We're, we're making an absolute claim. At least that's what the Bible is claiming about itself. Well, of course, when you start talking in those terms, you could say anyone can claim that any book is God's Word. I could write a book tonight before I go to sleep. It'd be a short book, considering how tired I am, but I could write a book that claims to be the Word of God. I could write a book that claims to be flawless. I can stand up here and say that I'm a flawless ping pong player. I can do that. It's easy to say it. Anyone can make those big claims. But if you make a big claim like that, and someone says, well, anyone can claim that. Yeah, anyone can claim that, and any book can claim that, but there's no halfway response to that. Do you follow me on that? There's no way that I can have a kind of medium response to a statement like that. You could have a medium response to the statement, I'm a pretty good ping pong player, but you can't have a medium response to, I am a perfect ping pong player. You're gonna either have to believe that I'm a perfect ping pong player, or you're gonna have to dismiss me as, as crazy. As a matter of fact, just like Lewis presented regarding the divinity of Christ, the argument that you might have heard of, liar, lunatic, or Lord, that same analogy works as it relates to the Bible. There's no halfway response. It's just like Lewis's response to the claim of divinity. He tried to help people think through what he himself worked through, and that is, when I read the Bible, Jesus is making extreme claims. He claims equality with God. He was crucified for being a blasphemer and making himself equal with God. He continues to try to kill him because of that. And as Lewis said, listen, if that's false, you got one of two options. Either he knows it's false, and if he knows it's false, then he's a deceiver and he's a liar. And now I'm dealing with someone that I'm trying to be told by people in churches to respond positively to, but he's a liar because he knows he's deceiving because he's making an outrageous claim, and if it's false and he knows it, then he's a liar. If he didn't know it, then he's crazy, right? If he's saying, I'm God, and I don't know really what I'm talking about, well, then you're a crazy person. If it's true, of course, as he said, well, then he's the Lord with all the implications of that. And because it all alliterates here, it's been a popular way to think about the extreme claims of Christ within the Bible, liar, lunatic, or Lord. I'm saying the same thing about the Bible. The Bible claims to be, and though we toss this phrase around, think about what we're saying. This is God's word, God's message, God's Revelation, that's what we're claiming. It is the written record of God speaking to the world. And you fold so quickly when someone says, well, there's slavery in it. There's laws regarding menstrual purity. I mean, these things cannot be. I mean, there's stuff about fabrics being mixed together in the Old Testament. So, you know, not, well, I guess that part's not. Listen, if you fold quickly because there are people saying there are things in the Bible that don't seem to be, um, I, I don't know, in, in, they're not things that we're going to think are, are, are good. I mean, are, it shakes our sensibilities. Well, then, again, what are we saying? Well, we're saying, well, it's not really God's word, or at least not all of God's word. Well, if it's not all of God's word, and this is a false statement, and this is not God's perfect revelation to human beings, well, then we have to ask the question, is it intentional? Are they intentionally saying it's the word of God, but they know it's not? Well, if that's the case, then this is a hoax. And it's been foisted upon humanity by a bunch of people that are shrewdly writing down statements that they know are not true. That, that Isaiah stood up and preached a lot of things that he did not get from God. That Moses came off the mountain and didn't get these words from God. That he preached these prophetic statements about a coming whatever, Messiah, nation, captivity, which he did. And all of that he knew was not true. Well, then 
we're carrying a book of lies and just like Christ should be dismissed as a liar, and I don't want anything to do with a liar. I certainly don't want to drag my kids to Sunday school to teach them good morals and ethics from a liar. I don't want to teach them good morals and ethics from a book of lies. And now you start looking at guys like, you know, Dawkins and, and, and Hitchens and the rest, and you say, and Sam Harris, they, they're on to something there. I mean, really, I'd rather be there than somewhere in the middle because it makes no sense if this really is not the Word of God, and it claims to be the Word of God, and it's an intentional deception, then they're saying what I would say, and that is, why in the world would I go to that book for, for ethics and morals? There's other religions that at least aren't trying to make such extreme claims as the Bible makes. If it's unintentional, if the people really thought they were preaching the Word of God, and they start talking about menstrual, you know, impurities or slavery or fabrics being mixed in Leviticus. Uh, well, if that stuff's really not God's word, but they thought it was God's word, well, then there's a lot of craziness in this book. And I can see why, you know, the Sam Harris's of life will say, what are we doing, right? You, it may not be a hoax foisted, foisting lies upon you to do whatever they think that these people were trying to do. It ended up getting them killed, but I guess they thought they were flying around on, you know, private jets like the hucksters today. But the point is, I'm saying this is a book of, of craziness. If they did die for a lie, it's crazy because clearly they believe the, the things they were teaching. So it's either a book of lies, a book of craziness, or if it's true that it is the word of God, well, then, of course, it's authoritative. And you would be foolish to dismiss it because it will, as it claims, one day be your judge. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge you, right? You got to judge. It's this book you keep quoting, right? Moses is going to judge you. This book is going to judge you. It speaks of me, and you're rejecting me. So you got three choices here. Book of lies, book of craziness, or authoritative truth. So the guy that says, well, any book can claim to be the word of God, I'm, I'm all about that. You're right. Any book can claim to be the word of God. And then engage in circular reasoning to say, well, I believe it's the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. And why do I believe it? Well, because it says it because the Word of God says it's the Word of God. Well, if that's the way we're going to think this through, I'm fine with your neighbor saying any book can claim that, but I'm not going to say, well, then we'll come to church because I'm going to teach your kids how to live by the ethics of the Bible. I'm going to say, well, if it's wrong, then it's a book of lies. It's an immoral book or it's a book of lunacy and craziness. But if it is the word of God, and it's the exact record of God's revelation to man, then I ought to live by it. Any book can claim to be the word of God. Let's spend the rest of our time talking about, well, why would I believe that? Any book can claim to be the word of God, but what we're saying is there's a kind of authority, we quoted this earlier, that says if you disregard this book, you disregard this message. You're not disregarding man, you're disregarding God. Isn't that, I mean, that is why they don't like the message. And that's what probably makes you uncomfortable sharing the message because really that's the kind of radical extreme claim you're making. You disregard this, you're disregarding God. So this is a big authority claim. Is it blind faith? Is it just believe me? Well, there's several passages we could look at, but let me use this one as a foundational point. And I want to start at the bottom of the verse. Paul says here at the opening verses of Romans, his magnum opus regarding the gospel, we've received grace and apostleship. God has shown favor to us in choosing us to do this, and we are now his authorized representative, the apostle, to bring about, why are we doing this? To bring about the obedience of the faith. You need to obey for the sake of his name, not just here in, in Rome or Jerusalem, but all over the world. That's a huge statement of authority. He's saying, we have been chosen by God's grace, we don't deserve it, to represent him so that you'd obey what we're telling you. And it's not just here, it's everywhere. I mean, that's the authoritative gravitas of what the Bible is claiming. How does that start? Well, he starts by saying, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. I'm a representative, authorized emissary of God, of Christ. Set apart for this message that I keep preaching, the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. He promised it beforehand, 
And he did it, as we said, regarding David or Isaiah or the prophets, as it says in Isaiah or Acts, right? We looked at Acts chapter 1, 27, Acts 3. That's the pattern. God speaks. He uses a prophet to do it. It's all recorded in the scripture. And he spoke about things concerning his son. And he was descended from David. And it was according to his human flesh. But there's the first thing. He promised it ahead of time. And then he was declared to be what he said he was, the son of God, Daniel 7, authoritative one to whom everyone should bow from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And that was done with an emphasis, with an exclamation point. In power, according to the spirit of holiness, there's another appellation or title for the spirit of God. And that was clear. The Holy Spirit was affirming the message through his, the, the second person of the Godhead, through the son, by the resurrection from the dead. Okay? There's two things. Christ Jesus our Lord, who through, whom we, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith. So here are two things that Paul starts his magnum opus, his greatest letter regarding the gospel, by saying, here's two things objectively that should help you understand why everyone should obey this message that I'm giving you. Because he promised it beforehand, and the centerpiece of the authentication of the Messiah was he was dead and then he's alive. Bible's credentials. Here's the first one, predictive prophecy. Just think about what the Bible is saying that should be objectively verifiable for everyone who can read it and understand it against the backdrop of history. He wants everyone to read it and understand it against the backdrop of history. If you can do that, you can utilize this verification. Here's the claim. God, the God of the universe, holds everything in his hands. He says things like this through, we believe, the prophet Isaiah. I am God. There is no other. I am God. There's none like me. Okay. Wow. Yes. None like me. I'm unique. I'm not like any other deity that people pray to. I declare, here's how he proves it, the end of what's going to happen from the beginning before it happens. And from ancient times, things not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. You want the linchpin in scripture of the first objective thing people go to in the scripture, to prove that the scripture is the word of God, it's this. That God speaks through prophets things that haven't happened yet that specifically come to pass in the timeline of history. That's the thing that is most determinative and most objective and most verifiable. And it's the thing that the biblical writers say, look at this. And so from a New Testament perspective, the apostle Paul says, all of this stuff about David, I'm sorry, Jesus, the son of David, all told beforehand which is exactly what we read in Acts chapter 3 in Peter's sermon. He says all this was stated beforehand. And, and, and Stephen says it too in his sermon. These things were told beforehand. Man, there's a lot of emphasis and challenge in a passage like this, five chapters earlier. He says there's a lot of ways people trying to be soothsayers and foretell the future and you know, through all the necromancy and all the fortune telling, he says this in Isaiah 41, 21. Hey, guys, set forth your case, says the Lord, says Yahweh. Bring your proofs. Okay, you want to challenge whether or not you should be loyal to me and obey my prophets? Set forth your case. Let's prove it. Come on. It's like the, it's like the prophets of Baal and Elijah. It's like, okay, here's our test. That's what the king of Jacob says. Let them bring them and let's, let them tell us what's to happen. I mean, Jesus lays down the gauntlet here. And I say that because the triune God, all the way back to creation, Jesus the Son is involved in making this case, and he reiterates it all through the Gospels. The proof. And you ought to believe through the things that God has promised and fulfilled in me. You can see, as he says, Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing right now. That's why there's a big gap, I think, between Old Testament and New Testament. That's my theorization of why there was 400 silent years. God wanted to make sure that's wrapped up, all the promises, and now he's bringing it to pass. So, someone else there is worthy of your devotion and obedience? Hey, bring it on. Let them tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us stuff before re recorded history and tell us stuff that was prophesied in the past and tell us stuff that came to pass and tell us stuff that's in the future. Lay it out. Give, give me the predictions. 
tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. I mean, if you really are wanting the devotion of the people, prove it. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed or terrified. Now, that's a different kind of thing. That's like the prophet of Baal's, right? The prophet of, of Baal, the prophets of Baal, they were challenged to have something miraculous happen. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. When abomination is he who chooses you. What a powerful statement. God's saying, and again, the secondary thing, I, it's not my focus right now. The first thing is my focus. Tell us what's going to happen in the future. No one else can do that. So, Wilbur Smith in his book just summarizes it. I'll give you a lot of things you can research, but here's the summation. And I challenge you to find anyone who's going to tell you different in any apologetics discussion, in any evangelistic discussion. Here's the summary of it all. The Bible is unique. It is the only volume ever produced by man or a group of men in which is to be found a large body of prophecies relating to individual nations, to Israel, to all the peoples of the earth, certain cities, the coming of the one who was to be the Messiah. Of course, he's articulating all the things that the Bible says, the Old Testament Jewish scriptures say. The ancient world had many different devices for determining the future, known as divination. But not in the entire library of Greek or Latin literature, even though they use words like prophet and prophecy. Can we find any real specific prophecy of a great historic event to come in the distant future? or any prophecy of a savior to arise in the human race. Islam can't point to any prophecies about the coming of Muhammad, right? They'll try with one or two passages, even in the Old Testament, but there's nothing even close. I mean, it's it, not even close. We'll, we can look at those in a study of Islam, which we've done, uttered hundreds of years before his birth. Neither can any of the founders of any cult in this country rightly identify any ancient text, although even Joseph Smith tried to tie his coming to, you know, I have sheep of another fold and, and Jesus' teaching. Anyway, we can look at those and say, is that really the intent of the text? Is it, I mean, we can easily discredit those. And that's cherry picking one or two. We've got a whole body of biblical prophecy specifically foretelling the future, in this case, you can't find that in any cult. You can't find that in any religious writings. You just don't have it. If you want to point to to Notre Dame, I guess, gets the, the, the Discovery Channel every now and then, uh, some special. Um, read it. Read it. Even read, if you've never read the Quran, read the Quran. Read, read the holy books. Read, read what's out there, and you'll see the Scripture is just in a category by itself, very specifically articulating things in prophetic statements before they take place. And that's why the title of that book is so helpful, The Incomparable Book, because it is incomparable in that you can't compare it to any other religious text. There's so many, and I'm going to give you some resources in a minute, but I just listed a few. Leviticus 26. Predicted what we see being played out in Ezekiel and Daniel over 900 years before it happened. Leviticus 26, speaking of the events of the exile in particular, as did Jeremiah 29. Got very specific about how long it would last. Almost a thousand years before it happened, we have it predicted even before there was a nation, even before there was a king. We have the prophecies about the assembling of the nation, the sin of the nation, the transgression of the nation, the idolatry of the nation, the captivity of the nation, and then the restoration of the nation. Jeremiah, he predicts a hundred years before it happens, almost a hundred years, how long the exile in Babylon would last. Isaiah 44 predicts the name of the Persian king 150 years before he arrives on the scene. Daniel chapter 9, 480 years before it came to pass, lays out how long it would be from the decree to rebuild the city until the coming of Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Six books for what it's worth to dig deeper. And it's worth something if you've never studied biblical prophecy. Here's an old book. It's a big tome, but helpful just to read through prophetic texts that are going to deal with prophecy. I mean, some of you have lock years set, perhaps. You can find them at garage sales sometimes. Um, they're not digitally out there. A couple of them are. But all the prophecy of the Bible is another one. But this one's more of a thoughtful, scholarly work 
not that Lockyer wasn't a good thinker, but same idea. Guide to scriptural predictions and fulfillments. Uh, Walverd uh, he likes to talk about not only things that were done in the past regarding the future, but I mean, past prophecies that have been fulfilled, but in this book, it's kind of fun to read things that are going to yet still to happen, which is faith building when you see God called it. He chronicles 37 of them that are helpful. This one just came out. I was um, happy to see this and the depth of this particular book. It, I mean, it literally just came out, I think, two or three weeks ago. And it's a tome as well. It's a big book. The Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy. I mean, so much of the Old Testament, of course, was looking forward to the Redeemer coming. Studies and expositions of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Speaking of a lot of material, maybe you're familiar with Michael Brown's work. This is a multi-volume set, but it's readable, especially if you have Jewish loved ones or people you're trying to win to Christ with a Jewish background, answering Jewish objections to Jesus, looking through all the biblical prophecies and how they relate to the coming of Messiah. This is a fun little book, and there are others, but I like Alvin McLean's book on the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. I think we have this in our bookstore, just a little book, but helpful in looking at that great 480-year prophecy before the coming of Christ presenting himself on Palm Sunday. A book that's got a lot more in it about a lot of things, but a section on predictive prophecy is the reissue of uh, McDowell's book that he did with his son, Sean, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And there's a good section in there on uh, predictive prophecy. So there's six titles for you just to get started in getting more and more detailed in what's out there. But I did want to quote Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Of course, it's, getting, it's ramping up in his sermon here and getting contentious. I mean, this is not a way to win friends and influence people, but he says, you guys have killed the prophets, right? Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecuted? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. I mean, this is what the New Testament claim constantly is. Christ the Messiah was anticipated. Christ the Messiah came. And I think any objective look at any passage of the Old Testament that deals with the Messiah can lead to this conclusion. Isaiah 53, MacArthur's book came out not long ago, Gospel According to God, which is his single volume on, uh, it's super readable, on Isaiah 53, which if you haven't read that, I'm sure that's in our bookstore as well. Anyway, and we could go on and on. Jesus from the tribe of Judah, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, line of David, dies a natural death, rises from the dead, arrives on a precise schedule. I mean, I've gone through all of the odds before, but it's kind of fun to quantify it, talk about the entire state of Texas being covered in quarters. 268,000 square miles of land in Texas. If you covered it two feet deep in quarters, and you only put one quarter in there that was a 2019 quarter, and I blindfolded you and let you fly all day all over the state and said you can go down there now, land your helicopter, get out and pick one quarter, right? What are the chances you're going to pick the one quarter that has that date? That's a, one, that's a one in 100 quadrillion chance of doing it. And the point is, if you do enough mathematics on just a handful of prophecies regarding specific things like where Jesus would be born, I mean, these math types have tried to look at what the odds of those, those things are. And it's like astronomical, right? That's a one with 17 zeros after it. Isaiah 42.9 Behold, the former things have come to pass. Just look at the record of biblical prophecy and new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you them. Now again, that's hundreds of years before Christ and many of the things in Isaiah that he's about to go on to say. I talk about Isaiah 53. I mean, we're 11 chapters away from that in the passage. But he's saying, look back to Mosaic days and look at how all these things that were prophesied hundreds of years before now have come to pass almost a thousand years. And then he prophesies things that are going to come to pass 700 years later. 
The record in the past as you watch the Bible unfold over a 1400 year period is that not one, not one of all the good promises that the Lord made, and this is early on in the beginning of the Exodus to the end of the settlement of the conquest, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass, and that's the track record of biblical prophecy. I know you think if you didn't grow up researching comparative religions, you think all the religions must have their holy books with their predictions. They just don't. So predictive prophecy. That was the one thing, right? He promised beforehand. The other thing is by the resurrection from the dead. So Christ's resurrection is the second objective proof. Now we got to spend an entire 90-minute lecture dealing with that and we'll do that. So that's an upcoming lecture. But I just thought we would close out the few minutes we have left thinking about, I mean, let's just put a bookmark there thinking, okay, if we can prove that Christ rose from the dead and that's the most reasonable conclusion, then I want to look at what that resurrected one thought of, of the Bible. And that's huge. And if I were going to throw out another book, um, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book recently, which is a real readable author if you know De Young's writings, he wrote a book on the, uh, I think he called it, you can look it up for me, The sure, sure Word, I think it was recent. But he's got a section on there. It's very, very short. Um, what Jesus Thought of Scripture. And there are other books out there on that topic, but that's probably the last one I read that deals with that topic, at least in a chapter. But if you really think about the fact that I believe that Christ rose from the dead and I think there's rational evidence for that, then you start saying, well, what did that resurrected one from the dead think about the Bible? It's mind-boggling. If this is a record of what they really said, which is I, what I tried to establish last week, I mean, think of all the things that Jesus said. He said stuff like this that is outrageous if it's not true. Matthew 5.18. For truly I say to you, he only sets up statements like that if he's just trying to get your attention, grab your cheeks, and point your nose and his nose and say, listen to me. When it comes to the Bible, say, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot, right? A, a, a seraph or a yoth. That, that, that's the equivalent in the Hebrew text uh, of the Old Testament. Of course, this is Greek. A, a seraph, just a bump on a letter that make a difference between certain letters, like a hey and a bob, or, or a hey and a tob, and others. You know what serifs and non serif fonts are like. That little bump on the edge of the, of the I or the L. Or a yo, the, a, a comma, the smallest consonant letter, here called a dot. I mean, clearly, the rhetoric of trying to say not a single part of the Bible, the law, that's the summation of the first part of the Old Testament usually represents the whole. None of it's going to pass away. I mean, you'd have to take heaven and earth and throw it away before the book and its details are all accomplished. I mean, I know you've heard that all your Christian life, but that is such a remarkable statement that Jesus makes about the Bible. Mark 12, 26. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? You mean that whole story about Moses and the sandals and the burning bush, you believe that really happened? I mean, just think about that. The Bible's narratives are really true, is what he's affirming. This is the, the person we're claiming, if we, if we get there, we'll spend a whole lecture on it, rose from the dead. If this one is about to rise from the dead... A couple years after he makes this statement, I mean, he believes that the Bible is true and that it was actually written by Moses, which, of course, if you go to seminary today, a lot of seminaries will say, well, Moses didn't even write this. You've read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, and he starts talking about, this is where the Sadducees said, there's no resurrection, and they're trying to capture him in this question they bring him about whose wife is this, um, who's, who, who's, Husband, is this going to be if the wife has these guys all die on her? Anyway, the point is, God is a God who's the present tense God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So even back in the Old Testament, you can find evidence of the afterlife and the resurrection. Life after death was the Sadducees' problem. That's what Jesus thought of the text. Matthew 19, 4, he answered, Have you not read 
that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. He's using the word beginning, which is the key word in Genesis 1.1. Of course, is the Greek version of it, which in the Septuagint, that would be the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. That would be the word, the idea of where, way, way back at the beginning, God made the world. And he says, you should know this. You should read it. You should see it as authoritative. You should know about genders. By the way, there's only two, <laughs> not a hundred or six. Um, male and female. And he goes on to talk about marriage. Have you not read? I mean, the assumption. You should, you should know this. It's in the book. Matthew 12, 40. For just as in the days of, just as in Jonah, I'm sorry, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This picture of the Old Testament story of Jonah, which has been dismissed by most liberals and neo-Orthodox and higher education of people that don't take the Bible seriously. Well, Jesus took the Bible seriously. This one that rose from the dead. He has no problem being revolutionary. I mean, if the Bible's not true and the story is a hoax, let us know. Matthew 12, 41, for the men of Nineveh shall rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The men of Nineveh rising up in the judgment with this generation. I mean, as, as de Young points out in the book, and it's a great line, and he quotes an older commentator, it, it, you don't think that Jesus is talking about imaginary people here that didn't really exist in a story that didn't really happen, coming and rising up against the generation of real people that Jesus is talking to. It just makes no sense unless Jesus is absolutely affirming the historicity of these stories and that the facts are, as Francis Schaeffer would say, truly true, right? It's true truth. Matthew 24, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, just to pile on here. Noah, the ark, really? I mean, that is, is true also. You can, go to, you can send your kids to a lot of Bible schools that won't believe the story of Noah's flood. But Jesus believed it and taught it. Luke 4, 20, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. So he's reading the scriptures in this synagogue. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He believed the prophecies had the fulfillment in him and they were happening in front of their eyes. Biblical promises about the biblical Christ coming true before their eyes. Luke 18, 31, and he said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. So God has spoken. It's codified through the prophets and the things that were promised. Everything they said is going to come true. Find another religious book or system that's going to make those kinds of statements about Books that were written and done being written 400 years before the coming of Christ. And most of those promises were 700 years before Jesus was even born. And he says, all that stuff, it's going to happen. Luke 40, uh, 24, 44, after his resurrection. These are my words that I spoke while I was with you. And I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You've heard the word Tanakh, that representation in our English language, transliteration of the three sections of the Old Testament, um, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is a way to describe the entire 39 book canon of the Old Testament. And he says, everything about me in those writings are going to be fulfilled. Luke 16, 29. But Abraham said, and of course Jesus is preaching this about the truth of what is happening in the afterlife. And in the afterlife, this guy is saying, I want my brother to go back, or I'm sorry, I want the Lazarus to go back and warn my brothers. And he, Jesus puts the words in Abraham's mouth. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. More persuasive then the resurrection of a person from the dead, Jesus said, is the proof of prophetic truth through the prophets and people should listen to it. It's authoritative. We talk about the inspiration and authority of the Bible, the God-breathed nature and the absolute authority of Scripture. Jesus is reflecting that in all of his teachings. The Bible's truths ought to be obeyed according to Christ. Another verse from that post-resurrection scene he said to them, he rebukes them, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Now, of course, the all in that context was the things he was saying prophetically about himself, but that's enough, let alone the rest of it, which, of course, he's affirming in the beginning, creation, genders, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abel. He references Abel, the blood of Abel to Zechariah. I mean, all these biblical figures, Sodom, Nineveh, all of it true, he's claiming. And again, this is the one that claims to be risen from the dead and declared to be the Son of God by power by the resurrection from the dead. That is the Christ who's espousing his view, espousing his view on the scripture that you have in your phone. Just said that one, didn't I? John 10, he quotes a passage that was mockingly stated regarding the wicked that are called gods in that passage. And they say, you're making yourself to be God. He says, well, wait a minute. Then the Bible that we all believe even refer to people there with that word Elohim with God. And again, it's not trying to prove his divinity by that statement or prove anyone's divinity, you know, the common divinity of human humanity. But his point is, as he often does very shrewdly, tries to show them that they have a higher standard for him than they do for every other thing in their past, whether it's David in the Old Testament or in this case, a quotation from the Psalms. But he makes an offhanded comment in John 10, 35, and scripture cannot be broken. It's the Greek word luo. It can't be loose. Matter of fact, when he says that speaking highly of the scripture and that it's true and nothing can pass away and if anyone relaxes one of these commandments, right? He'll be least in the kingdom. Remember that? That's the Greek word luo, to, to let go of, to release. That's the context, right? To, lack, to, to, to treat the scriptures in a slack way, like it doesn't have that high authority. Well, it's the same word here. It cannot be less than it is. It, it cannot not be authoritative. I mean, that's the statement here. Scripture cannot be loosed. It cannot be broken. It cannot be relaxed. And you know that, he's saying sarcastically to these Pharisees that are accusing him. That's just a great line. Scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be relaxed. It cannot be less than it is. It cannot be not God's word and authoritative in your life. I mean, that's just a huge statement that everyone was to assume in their day to be true. And he is affirming it. Scripture can't be broken. Well, there's more we're going to say throughout the series on the authority of Scripture because it's going to be woven throughout all the rest of the topics. But the Bible's making extreme claims and we cannot have a middle response to it. You've got to either embrace it as God's authoritative truth or dismiss it as a book of craziness or a book of lies. And I would say that if the resurrected one holds it as authoritative truth, you and I ought to do the same. And that's my passion and plea for you and your non-Christian friends. Let's pray. God. Help us to think through this in a way maybe that would be helpful to hang on to a few things that will be transferable concepts, uh, concepts that can be passed on. Simple truths, even this last section of the message tonight that if there's one thing I can say to my neighbor with confidence is that Jesus had a high view of Scripture. He believed it was the word of God and he rose from the dead to prove who he was. And man, I don't, I mean, I can't call myself a Christian and not have an aspiring desire to hold the same values that Christ held. And one of the values he held was the high authority of scripture, the perfection of scripture, that it cannot be broken. It can't be loosed. It cannot be less than it is. So God help us please to have that great respect for the Word of God, to know that not only do we have a, an accurate record of what was actually written, but what is written is claiming to be the Word of God and predictive prophecy and the resurrected Christ should make that objectively clear. It ought to be rational. It ought to be something we're confident of. So bolster our confidence as we become good students of the Word, and even if we need to buy a book or two and go a little deeper to have an increasing confidence more than we can get in a 90-minute lecture, I pray that you would help us to put forth that effort. Just let us be as sure and confident as Jesus, your son, was about the truthfulness of Scripture. In his name we pray. Amen.